Christina, I just I just got your email, so okay, great. So I, I won't be able to chat today, or I'm not at, at fields because um, I'm still in the states. There. Oh, okay, okay. So you're not at fields. Do you want to? You want? You can do it anyway. There's a lot of us online. I think they could hear you. Um, sure. Yeah, I can. I can host or or okay. chair. Mm -hmm. So so Eric Ling is going to chair today. So I'll just he's online. Does everyone hear the online people? Yes, we hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Okay, sounds good. So maybe we'll wait like a minute or two for people to come in and then and then we'll start. Sounds, Sounds good. good. So the majority seem to be online. Yeah. It looks I mean have uh, 15 online and it like we have uh 11 maybe 11 in audience maybe 12 plus the camera person yeah yeah maybe you have more online yeah and some of the online people are like uh brian newhart from the field Institute, and, and our room is online and so there's always online people like <laughs> oh, oh i see you you have logged in online <laughs> about 50 percent, i would say 50 50 <laughs> A true hybrid. But it's true that the people online don't need to wear masks. So that's the advantage. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I should put on my mask anyway. <laughs> on the other hand, we're in the today, so we're actually able to socially distance. Yes, yeah. You don't see the audience. They, but yeah. They do today. Are you really in room 230 at Fields? We are. Oh, because the view, it must be a wide angle lens. It looks like you're in the big room. Oh, oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so the fields. The first floor is the second floor in the fields numbering. I, I'm thinking of the <laughs> library. <laughs> I, I don't like the library because the board spaces are terrible. Yeah. No, you're right. I I, um, I I forgot that the main floor is all the rooms are numbered with the two, not a one. I'm not even sure the library has a number. Hmm. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's just called the library. You're right. You're right. 309. Oh, it does have a number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so um, uh, it's past two. So why don't we, why don't we get started? Um, so everyone can hear me, correct? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. So then uh, um, I'm happy to present that Azul, or Azul will be um, We'll be giving our talk or our first talk today and she'll talk about the introduction to cosmological perturbation theory the abcs of generating scalar and tensor power spectrum okay great okay thank you eric for introducing i'm happy for the invitation i guess partly on my own behalf uh, 
So today I'm giving a, this is the first time I think I'm giving this talk. So I prepared the talk very late, not night. So it might be full of typos. Uh, uh, don't be taken by surprise, but at least that might take, keep you awake to find my typos. Uh, right. So the reason I'm, I chose this topic is because it's kind of the building blocks of everything else we do in cosmology today. It's like the basis. And it plays a very important role how cosmology connect, connects to rest of the general relativity and how it fits in that big picture. Uh, I mean, there are other aspects of it, but the perturbation is right now in the modern cosmology, maybe the most important uh, piece of the science that we are working on. And uh, let's see if I have what happened. Isn't it? Okay, good. Uh, I will give you a quick uh, overview of what we see in the cosmos today. Again, it's the two are not completely like in serial logic, the theory versus observation, because in order to infer the observation, you have to feed in some theoretical model. So even though I wrote it that way, the two are a little bit like in the loop. What we observe today or what we think we observe has to do with what the assumption we put in the theory. And then obviously, in order to make sure it's the consistent framework, we have to go back and con constantly test those assumptions. And then I will go through the technical framework, a very crash course, quick, not too many details, hopefully, uh, of how we use this framework to produce everything else that exists uh, in cosmology and in the universe. Okay, so the first thing I have to tell you, obviously, is that yesterday or two days ago, the big news of JWST telescope came out. So I was obliged to put this picture on, even though it might not directly be related to my talk. Uh, but this is, in fact, a very impressive image of our universe in infrared. It's not the deepest. As we, I will show you, we have a deeper image of the universe, but infrared, the sharpest, the deepest we have, uh, courtesy of NASA, ESA, and Canadian Space Agency, and STSCL. Uh, but it gives me, uh, like the way I can fit it into what the rest of the story I want to tell you, is that what we see in universe consists of things that are visible by light. Um, like galaxies, the gas that emits radiation, things of that sort. Uh, a lot of this we categorize as baryonic matter, uh, consisting of electron and protons. And uh, do I have it here? Right. And believe it or not, when I fit it in my theoretical framework, that's only less than 5% budget of the uh, energy and matter in the universe. About 30% of that, this omega is the way I'm gonna divide the budgets of the energy and matter in the universe, is uh, dark matter. The things that we think that act like matter have the same gravitational effects, but are not visible. So there's a lot of research that goes into that, uh, where how you infer the existence of this, the, prominent theory is called dark matter, it is called particles. Uh, in fact, this image, uh, if you see there are like you see images of galaxies that are further back in the background, and the light as it has traveled towards us has been distorted by gravitational fields around it, we could use something like that to calculate the budget that goes into the dark matter. That's one of the methods we know it exists. There are other gravitational effects like rotation curves of galaxy, and we have abundant of evidence <laughs> to know there is some other kind of matter, but not visible. Now, whether we need a new theory of particle physics, whether other uh, quantum gravity uh, scenarios, what else can explain it? It's again, a lot of research is invested in that part. So uh, the amount of uh, matter or energy that contributes to gravitation. As I will say later on, when I write my Friedman equation, I will divide up 
how much energy density contribute to expansion of the universe. Oh, so let me move the, yeah. So omega matter, you know, it should be, oh, where is the omega matter here, right here. Omega baryonic. Uh, so the total budget should be one. Baryonic is, yeah, 5%. The rest of the matter, dark matter is 0.3 almost. And don't take my numbers too literally. There are people of my observational friends would be very objective uh, uh, of objections if I write it because they spend a lot of time measuring this to the very fine digits. <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah. Uh, and I can give you right away the answer. The rest of it is mostly in dark energy. <laughs> yeah. So now the lesson here is the energy density on the very what I want to take away and connect to rest of it. If I average it out on very, very large scales, it's very homogeneous and isotropic as we see it. It's pretty small. Uh, but on top of that, so that's why, in fact, that assumption that we make that we can use FR Friedman Robertson Walker space time makes sense because we, if we average it out, it's almost uh, uniformly distributed. Obviously, it's not because I see the galaxies. But what do I mean by uniformly? <laughs> Roughly, if I want to give you a back of. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Um, if I want to say, let's say, average it out in a sphere and then compare the deviation, a standard deviation in a, a sphere of radius r, uh, what we have this quantity, and again, I forget, I should show it on the screen. This sigma r characterizes the deviation from uniform, a standard deviation from uniform distribution, delta rho over rho in a sphere of r. So anything averaging above 10 megaparsec, uh, delta rho over rho is pretty small. The fluctuations, dips and dimples on the uniform distribution on those scale is a small. Uh, in fact, there is a famous sigma eight quantity that astrophysicists or cosmological observational cosmologists go after. That's around when you almost cross from uh, going from like perturbations or fluctuation being of order of one to being much less than one. So that's one piece that allows me to treat universe on very large scale as a uniform and isotropic uh, matter field or energy field. Now, uh, another thing that we do see on those scale is cosmic microwave background. These are the remnant microwave radiation photons that are, have been traveling since 13, 14 billion years ago, uh, the time of Big Bang, the moment that photons were not as strongly interacting with the rest of the matter. So they got released and came almost on a perturbed towards us. That background has cooled down. The temperature is pretty uniformly around three Kelvin, very cold, but it's everywhere in a space in every direction. Uh, and it was one of the amazing measurements uh, that won the Nobel Prize, I believe, in the 60s, Tenzin and Wilson. And then on top of that, we have made so much progress observationally. Not only we measure that uniform distribution, on top of that, we can uh, measure anisotropies of temperature anisotropies. Again, that one, unlike the matter, has not clumped as much. So perturbation has almost remained linearly as they were back then, uh, this delta T and T. So the deviation from uniform background is pretty close to like 10 to the negative fine. That's again another uh, important parameter that we measure in cosmology. And we in fact decompose this statistically in a spherical harmonics, analyze it. It tells us the shape of the spherical harmonics, for example, here in micro Kelvin, where you have a peak or you have a dip, uh, also is another way of telling us how much matter we had back then. It has to match to the budget of the matter we have today. 
what was the ratio, what was the radius of causal horizon at the time. And again, this other budget that I'm telling you, the dark energy. And also another way of, so this was, I know with some of you I've discussed cosmic strings because originally they were as one of the candidates for producing the inhomogeneities in gravitational fields and seeding larger scale structure. But this was a big evidence against them because they wouldn't produce these acoustic peaks as we call them. Or the scenario like inflationary uh, model would produce this acoustic field. Uh, so that's that. What else? Gasol, okay. could I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So what actually produces those peaks? Uh, why do, do, do we have? So in a nutshell, when, the, when we produce and we get, I get that's my goal of the talk. When I, in the end, produce this uh, power spectrum, the way they are produced, it, they come out in the same phase. And so they're, therefore, back when the matter or um, radiation was all entangled together, it acts like an acoustic cavity, like acoustic ball. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But then, so, right, so uh, that peaks at a pretty high multipole moment and all the others are very much higher. Exactly. Um, so these ratios are also tell us, for example, how much how much it uh, damps on down mm -hmm. gives us how much matter we have or this root load like neutrinos selects. and other things but the first one is for example it's kind of you have a cosine wave yeah if the waves were not in phase and that's what happened mm -hmm. with cosmic string you wouldn't okay. get this nice acoustic feature but because they all come out in phase so these are where the harmonics kind of happens so you get the peaks in these locations. The first one is kind of the gives you the size of the that big uh, horizon size, like my big ball that things are oscillating inside it. I see. So okay, thank you. The angular scale, yes. So and I also also struggle going from the unit to unit. So top scale is when you expand this in harmonics, LM expansion, and then you average it over, oh, actually there's a two here. So these are ALMs, this CL is expectation of ALMs squared. So I'm missing, that's one typo already here. Um, and then you plot this. So L to the angle, angular size is kind of two pi over L. Goes there. Okay, so now we put together all these pictures, the things that we observe in the galaxies, for example, and obviously, as I said, we infer the dark matter in between them, but this is one of the figures I think I do have the credit here or not, I should have, it's uh, coming from EBOS, I think, mapping, or SDSS, I guess that's why it is. So this DSS is one of the big surveys that is kind of covers most of the sky and goes pretty deep in space. If you want to do it in time, uh, so today is 13, 14 years since CMB. So it's kind of halfway. And then in the beginning, that's where the, so this is the furthest image of the space. And that's why I was telling you the James Webb image is not the deepest image of the universe we have the one we have is actually the furthest one is this cosmic microwave background and that's also pretty precise uh measurement the, it's, the resolution is pretty high it's 10 to the 5 delta t over t almost so um, that's the furthest image we have some dark ages that uh, the gravitational field has not been strong enough for matter to clump in but as the universe cools down eventually start to get form bounded structures and the gravitational instabilities uh, leads to a structure formation. Uh, is anybody reading the chats? 
the image of the project. Okay, that was from. Uh, it's resolved. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Now, uh, what else do I have here? Okay, but again, these images are not disconnected from each other, right? So I have at early time the cosmic microwave background. Uh, that's a source of energy momentum tensor, right? So it has to follow the girl. It should be mapped into the geometry. Same way the distribution of other matter sources. And therefore, it's kind of interesting because the cosmic microwave background can act like an initial condition of what we thought the universe was like perturbatively back then to what we see today. And in between, uh, pretty much the most important uh, force was gravity that formed everything, the structure that formed from then to today. So one of the tools that we have um, we do a lot of people do not me <laughs> there's a big research that goes into dark matter simulation cosmological simulation how you because it's very nonlinear. how the matter form the structure form you go back and forth from initial condition to final image and then you have to put in like baryonic physics hydrodynamics all of that to see what we have there matches to what we see today or by infer or not and that's uh, how different parameters in cosmologies are inferred. Right, so, uh, <laughs> uh, do I wanna get into it now before writing in this Einstein equation? So in a, a very simple sense, dark matter is a pressureless matter but dark energy is like the cosmological constant. It has negative pressure. And the way we realize we have dark energy is because the ordinary matters like radiation and uh, dark matter, they all have attracting features. So they make universe expansion to slow down. But what happens in 2000 is that due to the distance measurements of supernovas, people realize things like supernovas are fainter than they should be, which means they are further away than they should be. So they're uh, getting away faster. So it's like an expansion is accelerating. So in order to expand acceleration, you need some kind of negative pressure. One best candidate is cosmological constant itself, uh, which, which density is positive lambda, pressure is negative lambda. But something that can do that, we call it. We don't know what it is. We call it dark energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh yes, that's another terminology. It does. It's non-relativistic particles. Yeah. Okay. So what do we do? So given that what I tell you, so how did I make all of these inferences? I did have on back of my mind some kind of theoretical framework. For example, I assume the metric is isotropic and homogeneous to explain the background evolution. So that's the Friedman, Lamia, Robertson, Walker metric. Uh, that gives me a notion of how universe is expanding, how this expansion is changing, what we call Hubble constant, which is not actually constant, but it's the logarithmic rate of change of rate of scale factor expansion. Uh, but then on top of that, all everything else right our self existence of us depends on those tiny fluctuations that originated at early time so i cannot just use friedman robertson walker metric i need to go beyond that and the regime that we are doing that in cosmology is a linear perturbation theory pretty much because fortunately gravity the deviation from uh, uniform distribution or metric uh, stays on those scales is pretty weak and a small so it allows us to still use perturbation theory. Uh, this wouldn't work, for example, for black hole physics, because then the metric is way different it's like the uh, changes quite differently. Uh, and what you will see, as I will go through the next of the slide, I characterize mostly this perturbation through 
uh, two parameters. One is the scalar part, which is kind of similar to Newtonian potential, gravitational potential that we are familiar with, and uh, tensor modes, which are the new things in general relativity, which fortunately gravitational wedge, which was the big discovery of 2015. We finally observed them through LIGO detectors, even though they're coming from black hole measures, not uh, cosm primordial cosmology. Uh, then, what's that? Yes, so because they have two degrees of freedom, so we decompose them to two different polarization. So there is one scalar and two tensor modes, as we call them. Uh, we use GR Newtonium. In fact, most of the structure formation, once I have set up the perturbation theory at early time, like this cosmological simulation, they mostly rely, the background is evolving as it should be according to GR, but the clumpiness and instabilities, everything Newtonian mechanics is pretty much dominant. So you don't need that much GR modification for that. Lots of statistics simulation, as I said, uh, the other two key features that I didn't mention, and it was brought up, was acceleration, recent, we say recent, it's a still redshift of one, which I don't know, like 5 billion years ago, 10 million, <laughs> it's pretty old in time if I measure it, universe started acceleration, accelerating expansion, and that should budget for this another source of gravity, which has this feature that with pressure, neg uh, negative pressure that I mentioned. Another impressive thing that has come out is that now, nowadays we have measured the flatness of our spatial manifold. And it's pretty, seems to be pretty consistent with a flat universe. We don't seem to have uh, a spatial curvature. So omega k here characterizes the um, budget that goes into curvature. Yes. Oh, it's very important because they will, they, they are the ones that cause everything else to form. So they, they uh, basically produce the dips and wells or hills and wells in the original uniform gravitational field so that matter starts to clump. So everything else, yeah, comes out of them. Otherwise, we would be sitting on a, you know, distinguished, <laughs> undistinguishable Azul. uniform background. Azul, uh, can I yes. just say something? Um, uh, it's hard for the people online to hear, uh, to hear the questions that people are asking. So if you oh, could okay. read the question before you answer it, that would, that would be helpful. Sounds good. Yes. Thank you for telling me. Yes, the last question was that what uh, role the scalar perturbation play out? And my answer was that they are the most important one for the cosmology. In fact, we are not sure we do have any primordial gravitational waves yet. But anything else that we measure is due to the uh, all the structure formation in the universe or temperature and isotropies, they are due to this scalar mode. Mm -hmm. You said primordial. So is it, is it, do you have any idea, is the scalar perturbation something that would put the, the initial condition of the Big Bang, or is it due to fluctuations that happen after? So that's a good, so what the story I'm gonna put forward. Yes, so uh, Robert is asking, can these scalar perturbations be sourced before the, in, like, uh, I guess if I want to say it in my own language, like were sourced before the Big Bang or they cooked up out of fluctuation afterwards? So the story I want to put forward, and it's the next slide probably, is that like inflation or bounce that maybe Jerome will talk a little bit about. Uh, we want to say, it was uh, sourced by quantum fluctuation. Well, before the cosmic microwave background, before even Big Bang nuclear synthesis or nucleus formed. Uh, there are scenarios that like holographic uh, 
models or things like that that they're talking about. And I'm not very <laughs> versed in that, those kind of models, but there may be a, like, you know, it, it could be that it was mapped into sort of through some conformal field theory. At, it's not like a dynamical evolution that caused source them, but rather something else that happened non locally. Or something. Right. So, some of the properties that goes into what we have measured. So, everything that I told you about the matter fluctuations, the distribution delta rho over rho and delta t over t, with some obviously work simulation statistics, can be turned into these scalar fluctuations. And what we know, for example, on the scales that I'm talking about on one megaparsec to 3000 megaparsec, they seem to have this feature that they are scale invariant. The two point function doesn't seem to, uh, it has a very specific feature of scale invariance, which becomes a little bit more clear when I write it. So basically two point function, you turn it into uh, Fourier modes and you see it doesn't depend on uh, which mode you take in on very large scale, not a small scale. Obviously on a small scale matter forms and so it's the scale dependent issue. Uh, the power, the amplitude of this fluctuation is around 10 to the negative nine. Again, two point function, the full power spectrum is another way of characterizing it. One other thing that has been measured to good accuracy is that they, we call it adiabatic fluctuation. What it means is kind of like, they seem to be all of them, the perturbations in uh, temperature, potential, uh, the matter, they're all in phase. It's kind of, there's one source of that uh, the propagating degree of freedom that source all of them. Uh, so there was one single degree of freedom, whether it was originally few and then all of them convert to one and then led to the, what happened after. That's something, for example, that I've worked on or some other people work on. Uh, at very early times, we say these are super Hubble. Uh, what does super Hubble means? Uh, that means, uh, so, and I don't have a plot here for you, but uh, as the universe is expanding through the radiation matter domination, for example, today, uh, we, the fluctuations uh, go as uh, the, the wavelengths stretch as a scale factor A, but the curvature of the space goes as H. So uh, I see if I can do it on top of my head. Uh, and I do have a plot of it later on in the thing. Um, so in, in physical distance, let's say these are the scales. This is time. So if the uh, one over H is kind of like T, I guess it goes like that maybe, but this wavelengths, they go as A, they start to come into what we call Hubble horizon. Uh, so lambda one or lambda two. Uh, it makes a little bit more sense maybe afterwards. So there's a scale that shows like, for example, they didn't care about the curvature of the space time, or if they, or if they were very deep in inside this Hubble radius. So Hubble and expansion of the universe would be irrelevant. But if they are on this bigger scales, then obviously GR curvature of a space expansion plays a role. Uh, what else is? Yeah, and as I said, there is there are the gravitational wave, the one that were source at initial times, we haven't seen them yet. We have a constraint observationally over them. They are less than a 0.1 or 0.07. I think I picked up this number from Planck collaboration last updated numbers. So if there is anything, it's pretty small compared to a scalars. But if we ever observe them, there would be such a big news for early universe because that gives us another handle to distinguish between different scenarios. Yeah, I mean, there is the other story of given the amount of matter I have radiation today, 
at what time we switch trans, uh, transition from matter pressure dust region to radiation domination and so on. Big Bang nucleosynthesis, when the elements started to form. Nucleosynthesis. <laughs> So when we know that uh, things should have formed. Okay, so this goes back to Robert's question. What triggered them? That's the topic that a lot of us are interested in. Uh, there is a different proposal, how we can surface scale the perturbation. And uh, the big, the most famous one is inflation, proposed, I think, in the 80s. Alan Good, Linde, uh, Strabinsky, there are some of the uh, Andre Linde, prominent people who proposed it. Since, since then, there have been other ways of doing it or trying attempts. Each of them come with their own baggages. Uh, so inflation is an early phase of rapid expansion. Uh, that's one possibility, like again, accelerated quasi the city expansion. That could be the, the one that caused it. Uh, there is like the ones that Jerome and I are working on. Maybe universe was contracting, went through a bounce, and then it started expanding. Can we come up with a way mechanism to do it there? Yes. So inflation and this parameter I introduced later, epsilon less than one. It means you need to have accelerated expansion early time. Yes, and thank you accelerated expansion inflation you could have some kind of quantum gravity some other things where the rules of general relativity breaks down um, that's one possibility people like loop quantum gravity um, think about that, that kind of line uh, the other proposal that have come up like what we do like bonds or maybe you started out of a static universe then transition into expansion. These have to violate oftentimes one of the conditions of the general relativity, like in our case, null energy condition, for example, breaks if you go from contraction to expansion. There are other ways called tachyacoustic and other things like that, then you have to violate the speed of light limit for propagations. So it seems like, so that's why you can see inflation has a lot of um, fans, <laughs> but I don't think that's why I'm working on, I think the, the ans, it's closed, uh, uh, the, um, yeah, it's uh, like a closed case. You still have to explore what other options are there. Okay, so what is the theoretical framework? As I mentioned, cosmological perturbation theory is one of my tools, tool sets. I have, I need to, in order to source in most of these stories that I mentioned, not the quantum gravity one, what I'm going to use is quantum field theory in curve back, background. So, which means I don't quantize the gravity, but I do quantize the matter part. And I do take into account that uh, background is not flat. And then the promise or premise is that we can source the scalar modes from some quantum fluctuation, specifically like we like the vacuum initial condition. I think that's the nicest story. I think came out of nothing, right? But you could put on, people do work on maybe universe started in thermal equilibrium or uh, thermal gas of a strings. Uh, Robert Brandenberger is coming at some point. He may talk about that. Virtually, yes, you're right. <laughs> okay. So let's put the mat in. So what am I talking about so far when I bring F4W? I'm talking about the familiar metric, isotropic, homogeneous, that you can write with constant uh, curvature, spatial map, hypersurfaces, Einstein equations, Einstein tensor, and then you put all of these budgets that I told you on the right-hand side in terms of energy momentum tensor. In the case of uh, Friedman universe, that leads to one of the, I mean, it leads to two equations, really. Uh, one of the main one is the, what I call Friedman equation one or the Friedman equation, which is, as you see, this is where the budgeting was going in. 
So when I was budgeting things, I was comparing like in today, how much of the energy density here is coming from radiation, from baryons compared to edge, from uh, other things, and then from curvature. So that was that omega, big omega that I was writing. There are, there's another equation that comes out. You can write it as a Bianchi identity or continuity equation or another form. I like the continuity equation because that tells you ma total matter or energy is conserved. And the rho is energy density, P is pressure. Okay. Now, that was FRW, but as I, the whole point is that we are not in FRW. We have to deviate from that, which means I need to add something perturbatively, linear theory. And this is uh, where the, uh, a lot of like work has been done. How do you characterize the perturbations? There is a so-called scalar vector tensor decomposition, SVT decomposition. It goes back to lift sheets in 60s. And then uh, James Bardeen, who actually passed away last week, I believe, uh, he did visit Perimeter quite often. And he was uh, still active working mostly on black hole information paradox. Uh, Kodama and Sasaki and Mokano, Feldman and Berenbegbe. This was this is one of the seminal papers that if you were a student of Brandenburger, this was your Bible we would carry out to read the how this works. So you break down this perturbation because metric has, if you assume it's uh, symmetric, it has 10 degrees of freedom. How do you break them down to characterize which one is a scalar? And you divide them on the group of like rotation on the spatial. Uh, manifold of FRW. So depending on how they transform, you divide them. The other thing is, uh, so, and I, yeah, I will get through this laundry list one by one. Then you have to formulate it in a gauge invariant way, in a way that to say, okay, physics doesn't depend on coordinates. So how do I understand what I'm measuring is actually what's observable, connected to observable. Use the quantization scheme. And in the end, then solve the equation and drive the distribution of power spectrum and correlation functions. Okay. So, and here I'm giving you a little bit of a, you have 20 minutes crash course into the math, how it works, the, the, the decomposition. So I start from FRW, I wrote it in conformal time. So, if I'm using the rotation for dividing my different degrees of freedom, so G00 deviations remain invariant on the rotation. So there is one perturbation goes there, that's one scalar. Then you have vector ones, G0i deviation. And then you divide the, we call them the, this part into two parts. One can be divergence less and the part that has a divergence and you can get it as a, a scalar itself gradient of a scalar so i obtain another scalar and because the uh, si the vector is divergent less that gives me two degrees of freedom in the vector side and then finally you have the gij the metric on the spatial manifold you break that down into the trace the rest of it traceless then you divide it and you can do this as a math, simple math problem. Divergence less, trace less, divide it into another scale that comes out, another vector comes out, which again, because it's trans, uh, trace uh, divergence less, it gives you two. And then finally, you are with the, left with a piece which is trace less and uh, uh, also divergence less which gives you that final gravitational wave degrees of freedom uh, or the two tensor mode. So there is two left in this one, two degrees of freedom. So if you add them up, you give that the 10 that you started with. Right, so I assume like around that. But that's another issue because how do I know which one is the preferred Friedman background right so 
And what I want to know, no, I'm saying like I can also redefine time slightly, right? And that's the freedom of the diffeomorphism invariance that I have. So then we get to the next topic, which I have to uh, characterize the gauge invariant physical quantities. <laughs> okay, so there are the scalars, the four functions, phi, psi, p, d. Uh, there are the vectors. Uh, it turns out in cosmology, the vectors are the least interesting. There are some scenarios when you have pseudo gauge theory, things like that, that you might be able to source them. But even you source them, they usually with through some vorticity or magnetic gravity, something they decay away. So I will not get into them. The most interesting one, as I mentioned, is a scalar. And the next, which comes as a bonus, is the tensor mode or gravitational mode, which, as I discussed, you can break it into the usual, they call it two polarization, two different. There, it has two degrees of freedom. There's a way to break it down that people like. And uh, that has the two propagating degrees of freedom. The interesting thing, and you probably know it from other aspects of general relativity, general relativity has only two propagating degrees of freedom, two dynamical. And you can see that by the fact that none of the first four or the other two can be sourced unless you put something on the matter side. If you set that to vacuum, they go away. The only one that is the dynamical is the sometimes called the spin two massless particle or the gravitons, these two. Did I change the notation? Oh, did I? It is possible that I changed. D is the far, no, wait a minute. B, B must be by the typo. It should be the E. Yes, it's E. So D is e? I think so, yeah. Okay. Now it makes sense. Yeah, that's a, the next typo again. Okay. Right. But Cosmos evolves regardless of my choice of coordinates. And the physics should be diff invariance, diffeomorphism. So if I change the coordinates, uh, then I should still be able to get the same physics. Uh, so you can characterize that by through some change of coordinate, linear coordinate transformation, uh, like say function or four vector C. You can again divide this under the same rotation groups into the time component and the vector component into the uh, trace le uh, uh, divergence less and the scalar part itself. So that's there is like therefore this co coordinate transformation has two vector degrees of freedom, two scalars, which nicely if you do the do this transformation, you can see how metrics transforms, and then you can see, for example, how each of those scalar functions or vector function that I define can transform and you can always for example go to the gauge to remove two of the scalars and two of the vectors so already four of them are the artifact of choice of the coordinate they're not physical so you're left with two plus two plus two uh did i write it i haven't written like how they change but for the one way people like to do it is define gauge invariant formulation. So you make a combination of the scalar functions such that they don't change under the coordinate transformation. You say, you know what, no matter what gauge you are in, what coordinate system you choose, measure this big phi or big psi. If it's zero, it's, I guess you don't have any perturbation in a scalar the sector. Same thing you can do for vectors. But I don't know, it's not as illuminating as always knowing what coordinate you chose. And depending on what calculation you're doing, different gauges or different coordinate, how you choose your time might be uh, more suitable for your calculation. For example, sometimes it's better to take your background FRW as the one where your matter field has constant density, but the metrics obviously won't be. Or you might choose that's such that delta G zero zero is constant. So depending on which one you choose, you go to different gauges. 
and each of them have advantages or disadvantages. Newtonian, where I guess you manage to uh, take away E and that B, so you're left with that phi, phi kind of is like Newtonian potential in lensy calculation, that's a very popular one. The one I will use next is this co-moving one. I like that, so I choose my clocks such that the, the matter field that I chose is constant on that constant as, uh, time hypersurfaces. And then you have to do on the right hand side of Einstein equations same you have to perturb them and then you can solve the Einstein equations perturbatively. As I mentioned before really the key is the left hand side, because even though originally right hand side is perturbatively after matter instability has happened gravitational instability right hand side it starts to grow. Uh, but left hand side and you can do Newtonian physical other things for how matter gets clumsy. But left-hand side pretty much is a still valid in the metric perturbations. That side, you can still keep gravity weakly uh, in a weak field approximation. Right, so, and then you can do this in equation, but more importantly, what I'm gonna do is I want to quantize field. So action formulation is more important. So if I want linear equation in the action, you have to perturb everything up to second order because linear perturbation just gives you back the equation of motion and uh, and the final key remember i had now six degrees of freedom left after i choose my gauge out of those six because of neuter theorem again four other get removed because of the hamiltonian constraint and momentum constraint so that removes and that goes back to the fact that if I didn't have any matter, there would be nothing left except for the two, because two of the vectors and two of the scalars will also get removed and you have only two. But fortunately, I do add a source of matter, so then I gain one scalar back. So is, is that a typo in, in your slides? What does it say? It should be six minus four. Six minus four, yes. <laughs> that should be enough, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, exactly. So everything else goes away, but now I'm gonna add plus one. So now I add a matter source. Uh, so I need to generate the scalar modes. I don't want them to go away, right? So you need to add some matter field. Uh, so that's where the scalar fields in any most of these scenarios that we have you have a scalar field uh, that plays the roles of generating uh, perturbations at the in the beginning, you could have other things take scalar fields are the simplest ones that you can work with that's why the single field the slow roll, is the simplest vanilla model for generating a scalar perturbation at early time. So to begin with I go through the again the vanilla case. You pick a source like a scalar field with some kinetic term, some potential. Now you want to remember uh, there is more to that. I want to produce quasi density because there's also this back other back story that I told you. For example, the modes have to be super horizon. There are other back stories I need to solve horizon problem, other things that I didn't get into. So quasi density works very well in this case. It's a kind of scenario, so you pick or like tailor your potential and initial condition so that it falls into a phase that is slowly rolling and by slowly rolling it generates a scale factor that is almost exponentially expanding so it's like a FRW foliation of the CTA space almost but not exact because if it's exact again i'm doomed I don't have any scalar perturbation. So the slow roll that means. There is H of T, but it's very uh, slowly changing. And that's how we characterize it in dimensionless parameter epsilon. And even that epsilon varying slowly by itself logarithmically. And in that case, the Hubble constant can be approximated almost by the potential. The, in this case, the kinetic term is not that dominant. So the scale of the potential will set the scale when inflationary scenario happen. And then you had to have another story. How did you get out of it? Like reheating or 
a scalar field that starts oscillating. Now, the gauge that I'm going to choose now is one that I remove that one E. And also, I remove now, I could have choose, chose the gauge where one of the other two scalars in the metric goes away. But I choose my time such that this field is homogeneous. That's what, how I choose. Basically, that will come my clock. And from now on, I use the notation zeta for phi, the remaining a scalar that stays in the metric. And I'm going to focus on a scalar. As I said, vectors are not important. The good thing about SVT is that the uh, tensor modes decouple. Everything is decoupled, so I can just focus on one and go through that. So mm -hmm. was the one of the metric perturbations? It was, uh, did we have it here? Uh, yes, here, this one. So it's this one that I rem remains. In fact, this, yeah, I think this. Sort of like a spatial dilation. Exactly, yeah. And it simpli simplifies the calculation quite a bit. In fact, originally, like if they go that to that seminal paper, they used the Newtonian gauge. But there was Maldacena at some point who chose this gauge to do the calculation. I like simplified everything way more. So nowadays, uh, I prefer this gauge. Right. So then you go back, put everything back into your action, because I want to quantize. So I need the action. I put the original background plus perturbation into the my metric, into my field, perturb everything. And I'm going to uh, save you like 10 pages of calculation. And eventually, you extract the part that is away from the background, which is, gives you the Friedman equation again and stuff, in terms of an action for one for the a scalar degree of freedom. So there will be just this zeta curvature perturbation or scalar perturbations remaining with some background quantity in the front. And you see this has a very nice form, uh, which I can in fact in, do another change of variable and turn it into an action like a, what we call a canonical action. So by absorbing the background dependence, into the variable, you turn it into a field, which is sitting in a flat background. So it has a kinetic term, time dependence, gradient term, and it has a mass dependent, time dependent term, which people know how to quantize. It's like a, you have a frequency that depends on time. So you turn it into Fourier space and you expand it out. You raise the, uh, you raise your, a scalar into an operator, uh, then you have the lowering and uh, creation operators. You impose the communication commun commun uh, commutation relations. And uh, finally, you have a quantized field. Now you can set the initial condition. You want to say now these excitations, which were really sourced by that scalar field, let's say. For example, they start in vacuum. There is no excitation initially. So in the bunch Davis vacuum, which is for the city, for example, is applicable here. You know what the mode functions, these quantities should be in order for this. Uh, so remember, it's like quantum field is like an infinite number of harmonic oscillator. You set all of them in their vacuum states. And each single one has to have this form in this case. Uh, now, once you have that, you can also see how it evolves in time. So the reason I wrote the equation of motion here is so you can see that this regime, where if you are at very early time, this tau, the time beginning of inflation, that becomes very large. It goes from negative infinity to end of the inflation, which is set in this case zero almost. So then you are falling into oscillatory phase of the equation harmonic oscillation, where the initial condition is, as you expect, cosine and sine. But once time goes by, this mode, uh, this, this term starts to evolve. And so they start to go into the other regime where they have the, I guess, um, there is a Henkel function 
or best electrical function that comes out. So they stop oscillating. Exactly. And then the good thing is when you go back to zeta, because you have to divide by A itself, what's that Z form? Remember, I had done a change of variable. That also has one over tau in it. So that basically you get two modes. And you can look at this equation. It's not that hard to solve it. One of them has exactly the form of one over Z. One of them Z the squared or something that decays away. One of them becomes dominant and dominates the solutions as time passes by. So these modes, a transition into conserved phase uh, as they expand and become over Hubble. And remember, this is actually, uh, it, this is one over RH or Hubble radius. I have it here. So it, that's where I was telling you about this freezing, if they are super Hubble or sub Hubble. And then there's a quick math problem. You can calculate it, put this in, substitute it in at the point that they transition. And this is a very rough calculation that tells you uh, how it depends on the value of Hubble constant during inflation, the epsilon. And at the end, you want this to match the number, you know, the initial condition for a scalar perturbations are. So therefore you have a handle to say, for example, this inflation in model works if it was happening at this scale with this epsilon, this slope of the potential, or this doesn't work. Similarly, you can do that for gravitational wave. And this is where things get interesting because then you can see if you, ha you do have, you can produce gravitational waves primordially from vacuum fluctuations, but the amplitude compared to other one is much smaller. It goes as epsilon, which is changed basically in the quasi part of the decitter. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, this gives you not only that there, you can measure the exact dependence of this thing on K that also gives you what epsilon is. So you have a framework that everything has to fit into each other and be consistent. And for example, now, right now we have what we believe the tilt of this thing, 10 to the nine, negative nine gives us a handle, like what epsilon should be, it should be less than 4% and this one so it should be. And I think I'm almost done. So this, uh, basically what inflation does is that trick is in this special equation. It extracts the vacuum fluctuation, make them go through this phase, and then keeps them constant until later time when we want them for initial condition. They come in and they source the gravitational potential. And this is the image I wanted to give you. So this is the time, the horizon, uh, the uh, horizontal axis, and this is a scale, the vertical axis. So Hubble radius in co-moving is shrinking, co-moving a space, so I extracted A out of it, but lambdas are a constant in co-moving a space. So in this phase, they are oscillatory, they cross Hubble radius, so that's when they cross to that other regime of the equation, they are conserved, remain constant with their amplitude, and later on, when universe transitions into radiation or other things, they come in and source the gravitational uh, dips and hills. And so, and an upshot is like a satellite, like Planck satellites that in 2018 goes and measured on isotropies in Planck and then combine it with other observation and tells you which one of these inflationary model can fit the data or cannot fit the data for example uh, that ns is the tilt how much that uh, power spectrum that i showed you actually has some k dependence uh, away from exact scale invariance exact would be one here so it's not quite exact this is slightly off so this is where the data is tensor to ratio these are the bonds we have on it and you can see, for example, if potential is phi squared, that would be the orange one. Uh, so just for people who haven't looked at this kind of plots before, these are likelihood plots. So basically in the middle circle is where everything is good, the best fit, and this outside is not good. That's the last slide. Uh, so you find your best fit models. Like, for example, this hilltop quadric model seems to be a good fit. And yeah, 
that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Anna. Um, so yeah, yeah, I can't see the the audience um, on Zoom, so you'll have to to take the questions from there. But if anyone online has questions as well, so. Um, I have a I have a question. If if no one's in in the audience has a question yet, uh, so the the epsilon. Um, what, so the epsilon was the parameter that you got to play with in, in your model. I, I don't quite remember what was the epsilon. So epsilon is the logarithmic variation of Hubble constant. So how much basically do you deviate from exact this sitter here? Oh, okay. Uh -huh. So if yeah. H was constant, epsilon would be zero, but it's not a constant. So that measures how much away you are from the sitter basically in, a way, in one way to think about it. Oops. Okay, so and so when you get to um, let's see the slides a little later, right? Because you because you because we measure yeah this slide here we we measure the power spectrum and and the tensor to scalar ratio. So these would put constraints on what what epsilon has to be essentially. Exactly. So I what I didn't put here is like if you calculate this, this has like a k to the n s minus one. Uh, so. Really, there is a dependence like this. So it, there's a pivotal a scale that they measure it. So if NS was exactly one, it would be a scale invariant. But as we saw in the last, uh, it is not. It's in fact 0. 0.96. And this thing is related to the deviation from one is exactly, uh, I, and I don't remember the exact formula, but it's like, two epsilon plus eta or epsilon minus eta. It's a combination of linear combination of epsilon and eta to, well, not linear, to leading order. It's some coefficient of epsilon and eta. So mm -hmm. if this is, this is, uh, so that's one way to know what epsilon and eta can fit. So if I put phi squared potential, then tell me, for example, what epsilon and eta are and what R is and so on. I see, I see. And, and then and then just a, a follow up question. Um, so I mean, I mean, I know, like I read a lot that, you know, people say that the, you know, um, inflation, you know, one of the one of the predictions of inflation is the scale and variance in the, in the power spectrum. Right, exactly. And, and so this is this is all related to that, like, if there wasn't inflation, then you wouldn't have gotten um, these measurements to work out if you yes. just had radiation. Yeah, so in fact, in radiation, they would, first of all, you wouldn't be able to conserve it. They would be extremely small. Everything at vacuum, I think they go, so, and the other thing is, yeah, the easier way to say it is that instead of a scale invariant, they're very blue. So, so the a smaller, the larger the K, the power is higher. That's what I'm saying. So they are high at, at smaller scales, but on the cosmological scales, they are negligible if you put vacuum. Um, but yeah, so this would be one would be exact scale event. We are close to it, but not exactly. And this is one of the other things as a theorist, I always say we need a scale invariance. And then they're like, no, near a scale invariance. It's like we, we put so much effort to measure this. Like, don't say the scale invariance. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, thank you. No problem. I have a minutes. question. Uh -huh. Sure, I can ask the question while people go and break. I mean, uh -huh. sure. So, in this picture you have on the board right now, um, you have or on your slides right now, you have the three different um, scenarios: yellow, purple, and and teal. And then this the um, the oh, the uh, ellipsoidal shape regions are the data. Right. Yes, so this is, uh, yeah, it's, I think, actually my own. So the gray, green, uh, the gray, red, blue, these are the data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what the data prefers and what right. it means, for example, let's say TT, it means uh, correlation function of anisotropy of temperature with temperature. 
of the CMB. This one is temperature with polarization of the photon in CMB. So they combine all kind of different experiments. I mean, these are all CMB at this point, right. but then you can add lensing. Some of them have even other surveys in it, BAO. So these are the data preferences. And right. then these are the models. And the difference, the reason, for example, let's say natural inflation goes, can be always here, go all the way from here to here, from yeah. one side to other side, that has to do how long inflation lasted. Right. So that's why they have like, I believe one side is 50 e folding, like 50 times a, uh, like a of e to the a, how do I say? So a mm -hmm. became 50 fold larger than when it started inflation. Uh, one is 60. Um, that's the reason they're like this, uh, the I width of this. Uh, but then the um, the fact that they are like this, I believe, is between parameters of the models they vary them. Oh yeah, okay. not sure actually. I think that should be. So yeah, then, my next cool. question is: Can you explain a little more on the blackboard about the um, the gauge you're using, where the mass is co-moving or something? Right. So in my case, my source was the a scalar field right so right let me get rid of this so this was the field i had mm -hmm. so similar to perturbing the metric i have to assume this field also has a background homogeneous uniform component uh, so i can write it here Oh, okay. Because it's also a time dependent, time and space dependent function. Mm -hmm. So I would assume it has a uniform piece plus delta phi, uh, x and t, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm choosing my time, I said I have a choice of choosing coordinate to remove the other scalar. But one other option is, let's say this is uh, the original time coordinate that you start with, and then the constant phi surface is the whole thing, is something like this. Then you could say, OK, why don't you choose uh, phi, your time uh, or a constant time hypersurfaces to match exactly because it's assuming this is a small to match exactly that surface. So then this becomes your T naught. So you take the gauge where delta phi becomes zero, or in other words, you go to a gauge that phi becomes, yeah, phi of T tilde and X is only phi of t tilde doesn't have any x dependent anymore uh -huh. does that make sense yeah i think so i'll think about it more but that's that's clear yeah but uh, yeah it's a uh, it's i mean you can choose the other ones too but this one because the field perturbation just vanish <laughs> choosing this case makes uh, everything way more simplified to do the calculation. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a general question about about perturbation theory. Um, you we, you know, I, I think everyone when it comes to cosmology, they there's this picture that you know, of course, the universe isn't perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, um, but but moreover, as like time progresses, the homogeneity kind of gets gets worse and worse, right? Like you get clumping of of galaxies, of you know, dust, of formed galaxies and galaxy clusters, right? And so somehow in my head, it's like, if you go back in time, uh, you should be more isotropic, right? Right, and so, yes. So a question would be, you know, using this perturbation theory, would there be a way to actually quantify this? So I'm thinking like, suppose you start off with some initial data, right? Like, let's just say a, a flat FLRW, say something that was close to 
you know, start initial data with this with your perturbation theory that's that's close to FLRW, and then if you were to evolve that, you know, via the Einstein equations with some maybe dust model or something, does the perturbation in some sense grow? Uh, sorry, well, I lost. I lost the last sentence. What was the last one? Like, like my yeah. So, so it's like, does if you start off with initial data that is that is close to FLRW, but like if you if you started off something that was exactly flat and you gave it a dust model, then you know by uniqueness of Einstein's equations, you would evolve into the to the FLRW model that is that is that has dust right with the scale factor of two thirds or or whatever. So, so then my question is, if you take initial data that's not exactly FLRW, but, but close to it with, with this, you know, with one of these perturb with any of these perturb metrics, um, would there be a way to quantify the perturbation, like the difference between, between what FLRW is and your perturbed model? Yeah, like that, does entropy increase, basically? Say again? Like, does entropy increase? Oh yeah, so entropy I mean, is because you're talking about it being less or you know, or or does entropy decrease actually because you're saying it's getting organized. Oh no, I'm mm -hmm. saying I'm saying that entropy should increase and I and I and I think about it in terms of Penrose's way where clumping actually is is entropy increasing, right? Clumping of matter, right? Because mm -hmm. you started things with with dust everywhere, homogeneous uniform. Yeah, yes. and then as you grow, as you grow, then things are becoming less homogeneous. Right. Yes. So yeah, so the entropy definitely has to increase. But the funny thing is actually most of the entropy of the universe is going to end up in the black hole's budget, from what oh. I remember. Um, there is the dark energy because it has a horizon, right? If it's, for example, lambda, there is some of that. And then there is the entropy in the photons and baryon. Um, what uh, it's actually my memory is foggy about this, but what I remember, they all increase, but at the end, they are negligible compared to the um, dark energy and black holes. And I don't remember which one is Jerome, you might remember. Have you looked at it? But it is one of the issues that people looked at definitely because then the issue is the other way around. Like, why was entropy? And I think Penrose and others bring it up like, why was entropy so small in the beginning? Like, was it natural to start at such a low entropy state? Um, yeah, now, like there is the question of how do you know, like, you are in FRW, close to FRW. So some of the uh, tests that people do, and uh, it is more actually becoming more and more, picking up uh, more, but people have always thought about it. Like, for example, one thing is, first of all, you can use CMB to test the isotropy. Like if you were, and like at least you have, pro people have proposal, like if the light is observed from another, uh, of, in the frame of another observer as a galaxy and then get reflected, how the polarization changes. Uh, you can put some constraints on that. But you can also start with first principle, like what if, for example, we are not in FRW, we are in a boundary universe, or we start with some anisotropic initial condition. Where do we end up? Do we end up in FRW? Is that the attractor or not attractor? Uh, but I mean, these are all yeah, very good questions which are being debated and people do spend some time on them and some people are really into that. Uh, becomes even more, I mean, the issue of entropy and things like that that you brought up also connects to eternal inflation. And if you have always some part of the universe inflating, how do you measure how much entropy in one piece of the universe is compared to the whole universe? Can you separate it piece oh, by no. piece? Uh, yeah. If I may, I can maybe give a follow up on Eric's question and give a simpler answer uh -huh. i think you, you, there, your question makes uh, makes total sense if you you could imagine starting very close to frw with small perturbations in a dust dominated universe and just let this evolve and solve the linear einstein equations and you would definitely find that you would you would observe this clumping you would find that the perturbations are growing as a function of time and, uh -huh. and you can certainly quantize that 
quantify rather that and uh, up to a point where uh, these fluctuations would eventually become nonlinear and then you, you have to put aside the linear approximation and get into more sophisticated techniques uh, but this is this is fairly well understood i see okay so 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 within the linear regime you can look at it and you see that the 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 perturbations actually do grow okay yeah i think that that was mostly my my question thank you cool 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 in fact i mean on on small scales the the einstein equations in the linear regime look a lot like the newtonian theory of, of gravity um so the intuition there you, you can just map it and if you have matter it will attract gravitationally it's going to clump if it has no pressure it's going to yeah that's going to be very uh, efficient as as uh yeah the, the perturbations are going to grow in amplitude as a function of time uh-huh uh-huh so, so do you observe the clumping the way it happens along these long strands instead of just into galaxies so so I think so as I said this really only applies on 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 scales smaller than the Hubble scale but I still would say on large scales meaning where the the where FR, the FRW approximation holds to 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 zero at order and where you still have only linear perturbations not when you enter into nonlinear regime and um what, what was your question again? Sorry, I got lost. <laughs> I don't have a, well, you know, the picture on top of the uh, seminar is one of those pictures of how the galaxies are organized on a very large scale with them clumping along strands. And then there's these dark regions that have nothing. Yeah, so, okay, so uh, what we usually predict will be the statistics of a, a dis distribution of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, we can compute the the variance of the distribution of galaxies for a certain yeah, as a function of uh, the wavelength of the fluctuations or of the wave number and the and then we this this variance we, we call it the power spectrum and we can uh, we can from our observations of the galaxies from the large scale structures we we can get numbers for that power spectrum with error bars and in the linear regime we we can uh, use the linear perturbation theory and, and the agreement is quite good. Um, so those images come from numerical people? So you mean the picture or? Yeah, I like that picture. So the picture must come from, from uh, some numerical um, work, yes. So usually when you work in, in this physical space, uh, they usually use n body simulations uh, to to yeah track some set of particles that evolve gravitationally. Thank you. But in this, um, I, I think I know the picture that you're referring to, and and correct me if if I'm wrong about this, um, but I think. Uh, the strands that you're talking about where the galaxies kind of they they you know like there's these dark voids and then there is um i think i think a, a, a large component of that is or or one of the things that is important in actually getting those strands was you know the the distribution of dark matter and dark energy so if you were to just use dust or something i don't think that you would get those strands no in fact yeah the the dark matter is most the most important thing um yeah, absolutely. So, so Jerome, when you were talking about, you know, they said like, okay, you, you can have, you you know that you're, you have these approximations within the linear regime. And so, so they're up to, they're, they're good up to a certain point, like until the nonlinear regime, of, of course. Um, but can you say like quantitatively, like a distance and a time where these things would be good? Like, you know, for the first, and I don't know things in terms of Hubble radius. So if you could just say years and, and distances, like somehow that's easier for me to understand before I try to do the conversion. Uh, right. Mm. In fact, we we don't even talk in terms of time usually. We usually use redshift. Yeah, yeah, I know. No. Okay. 
put it in. I can probably convert it from what We, we can convert it later, honestly, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think about the spot is a bit cruel right before he's about to speak <laughs> in eight minutes. <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right. Just to be fair, Jerome can answer that question later. <laughs> Do I, you want to get any tea though before you speak? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just want to. That was a that was a that was a challenging question. It was a good question, Eric. I just wanted to. It's eight minutes before his talk. Your camera, Christina, is pointed squarely at a copy of Beam and Ehrlich. Every time you speak, all we see is the word Lorenzian. <laughs> I have somehow turned around my camera. There, because I was using Beam and Ehrlich. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what's, it's leaning on Beam and Ehrlich, my, my lap, my iPad. <laughs> That's that's actually quite appropriate. Yeah, it just made it look like uh, the text was talking. When, uh, <laughs> that gave me like lots of you know you know my questions were twice as important. <laughs> my 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 laptop right now is leaning is leaning on O'Neill. So you know, okay. <laughs> to, to, be <laughs> to be completely fair, mine was leaning on a few a few there. So I, I'll just uh, just let everyone see the full set. Okay. I got my DeCarmo spectral graph theories for a different project and differential and, geometry. Uh, the Shane Yale lectures. And if I could point my camera down, it's fixed though, but if I could point it down, you could see all three of them behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I got the spectral graph theory for an undergrad research thing. Just easier than, than getting them to learn the Laplacians and stuff. I was like, ah, it's all matrices. <laughs> it's too great. <laughs> Yeah. Rick, are you still, you're in maybe New Jersey or Miami at the moment or somewhere? Yeah, no, I'm currently in New Jersey, so I'm moving out of my apartment right now. So oh, I'm you are? Yeah, I'm literally moving out tomorrow, and then I have a plane flight 